and feel free to interact in the chat box. So designing between the possible and the impossible, this is a reflection um, post my PhD thesis defense, which occurred in 2015 at the University of Twente. And over there, I was really interested on how can design be of help for people that are non-designers so that they can also design or learn something from design that would be worthwhile for their practices. And I identified something which is called expansive design, which I will explain throughout my presentation. But first of all, let me position this uh, small lecture, this simple lecture within the broad discussions going around in the field. There is a conference in, happening in the Netherlands, which is becoming really impactful all over the years called What Design Can Do. And the purpose of the conference is to stimulate people to think about design in broader terms, not just design for designers or design for designers' clients, not even design for design users, design users, but really design as an, um, like a human attempt to overcome um, the social contradictions of our society. And, and, and taking this broad perspective, what can designers do as part of these uh, bigger questions like climate change, like social inequality, political instability. So it's a very positive, exciting conference. But there are some criticisms that sometimes show and display the naivete of this, some of the design discourses. For example, this marvelous book that's coming out very soon by Silvio Lorusso, <coughs> a design critic, who is um, telling designers and remembering them, look, these problems that you are now trying to tackle have been tackled by other fields uh, for many, many years, even centuries, and they cannot figure out simple solutions to them. So he's drawing attention to the limitations of design as a field that can encompass so many other uh, topics. So the title of his books is aptly posed as what design can do. And my presentation is trying to fit between those two different poles of this conversation. And I'm on, much more interested in not so what designers can do, but what people who are non-designers can do with designers or without designers, I mean expert designers. So my question for this presentation and things that I like usually to do is how can people do what design cannot do right now? because they need to, because there's a pressure to do that. Social inequality, um, uh, climate change, uh, and, uh, and political instability, these are really concrete problems that people face in everyday life. If design cannot help them with that. I mean, design is escaping and not providing for what people really need. Therefore, we need to think about and respond that aptly and, and thoughtful, as Silvio Russo reminds us in his book. But let's come back to the origins of this field. I'm choosing among many of the different definitions of design, this one because I, I want to criticize it, but on the other hand, I also want to take part of it as, as my uh, foundation for design. Uh, Herbert Simon wrote this um, very famous book, uh, Science of the Artificial, also very controversial. A lot of criticism has been posed to this particular work where he poses that everyone designs Everyone who's devising costs of actions aimed at change excites the situation to preferred ones. So this is not really um, something that only graphic or industrial designers do, but also engineers and even any kind of profession in other field that need to change situations according to some particular preferences. So design is the process. And he devises a lot of... Um, investigations based on games. That's why in this picture you see a lot of games in his table. He's using games to understand design. And me too. I'm also doing that. And you will learn about it in a few seconds. But uh, bear in mind that these games that he's dealing with are uh, mathematical games that have a finite combination or uh, limited combinations of possibilities. And the kind of games that I'm interested on are games that change the possibilities that uh, are really creating new possibilities. But if the problem is that we stick to the definition of um, Herbert Simons, uh, changing the possible seems almost impossible because uh, that means someone has to change their individual preferences. And if some people don't want that, then you cannot change the possible. And, and he really was trying to express 
a moment in history where that wasn't a problem. Really, there was a huge economic growth that enabled all these different preferences to be fulfilled. It wasn't the, the times of uh, mass production, and but also mass customization becoming uh, a really important. And industrial design was really um, being uh, or configured as a, as, as a practice and also as an academic discipline about that time, doing this kind of work, uh, creating the various shapes of cars that became known as styling, this approach of trying to fit different preferences. So you could find a car of any color you wanted, of any shape you wanted, of any kind of ideology <laughs> that you wanted to express by choosing that. Well, this marked the, the, the gist of the time uh, for design at that time. But the problem is that uh, the oil crisis and all kinds of crises that happened around the 70s or actually beginning of the end of the 60s really turned this kind of approach uh, not viable and a lot of uh, turmoil uh, took over the political scene and um, or the, the protests uh, championed by uh, students, especially in France, they put into the words what was going on, the spirit of time in the world. And this uh, motto, be a realistic, demand the impossible, which seems contradictory, really, really expressed what they wanted to um, convey, uh, the, more, the more progressive people. They really wanted to say, look, you're not being realistic in trying to do the possible, because doing the same as we have been doing right now, it will uh, destroy our earth. <laughs> we cannot keep consuming the same as we consume. So can we uh, reduce consumption and still live a good life? This was all, this were one of the questions that the student um, movement of 68 raised. And the problem is that uh, of, although they had a marvelous impact and very interesting uh, initiatives, like for example, the Provo white, ban white bike plan in, in the Netherlands, where they just invited people to paint their bikes white. And after they do that, they would allow anyone to pick up that bike and use it as it was a shared bike with any bureaucracy whatsoever. That was one of the first bike sharing services ever. And it was really neat. And it had a very important impact in the process of uh, pedestrianization of the Netherlands. And, uh, rich, and what happened later on was much more structured than that. But this initial move was really important. But oh, this was one of the few examples of something that this movement managed to, um, to give continuity. A lot of the demands and the claims of the 68 were not picked up and we could not find a way of keeping going on, especially uh, after crossing the 80s the age where neoliberalism became um, a, a major uh, political approach and economic approach. And the words of Margaret Thatcher uh, on there is no alternative, also known as Tina, and there's no alternative to what? To this neoliberal approach where you have to cut uh, the state costs and, and, and rely on private entrepreneurship for providing for people. Well, uh, this was also something that other people would interpret as there's no alternative to capitalism, not just neoliberalism capitalism, but capitalism in general, because um, any kind of approach to develop uh, an alternative to that uh, was somehow uh... Oh, sorry, are you still there? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm going to open this door just to make the connection better. I hope it doesn't uh, get in any hiccup. So coming back, I was telling you that there is no alternative to capitalism, not just neoliberalism. And what happened is that um, capitalist designs, they became really um, aggressive in the competition, not just inside capitalism, but really against other forms of um, uh, in between, uh, between capitalism and uh, communism, the socialist alternatives of uh, the democratic alternative of, the, of Chile, for example, they devised a way of uh, shifting and transitioning society to 
uh, socialism without um, a coup, without um, any uh, violence uh, like happened in other places like the Soviet Union or Cuba. And they managed to succeed for a few years until um, uh, a lot of different countries and nations interfered with their internal politics. Brazil was one of the countries, unfortunately, but also the U.S. And uh, cyber scene was a very important part of the plan for Chile to become uh, a more responsive socialism to the needs of people instead of this um, traditional five-year plan that uh, Soviet Union implemented. They had a more uh, active planning where they would rely on data coming from the production units and the consumption units all the time and visualize in this incredible, beautiful sci-fi <laughs> Uh, room uh, called Cyber uh, Scene uh, Co um, uh, Co -op uh, what was the name? Operations Room, and this has been documented, and only now we are learning about it because it was it has been destroyed by uh, the coup that ended the socialist alternatives of Chile in '73. And right now we know about this project because of the investigations of Adam Medina, a researcher from the from MIT but also uh, from the very nice uh, podcast by Eugenio Marozov, the Santiago Boys that has been Santiago Boys that has been around just a few weeks ago. I really encourage you to check that because a lot of people think there is no alternative to capitalism and to uh, advanced technology. And this was a really important, interesting example where technology and design could play a role in uh, producing alternatives that will be more solidarity to people and not just emphasizing competition. Not right now, in our current times, the uh, situation is really worse than it was in the 70s and the 80s because, indeed, we don't have even the Soviet Union, we don't have the Chilean democratic um, uh, alternative, and even Cuba is not becoming viable any longer. And it's, we are coming to the point where it's easier to imagine an end to the world than an end to capitalism, as Mark Fisher has written in his uh, Capitalist Realism book, which is a very important one to understand our current times, but also to um, enliven us with the hope that we can do differently because capitalism as it is going right now, yeah, it seems like it's going to bring us to the end of the world, especially uh, if you consider climate the effects on capitalism, climate change. And how design is responding to that nowadays? Well, speculative design has been very um, uh, proactive in terms of imagining the future of our society and in these broad terms. However, um, speculative design so far hasn't been trying to change this future that much. They are mostly trying to make us aware that we are going to get to the end of the world if we don't change our, the course of actions. So if we don't uh, insist or demand that the preferred future that we want is the one way we want to have atomic weapons, for example. So how they do that? Well, they design an atomic plush toy so that you get used to be afraid of dying of an uh, nuclear annihilation situation so you can naturalize that of course they don't want this to happen they just are creating these objects for us to very think as society to think uh, which kind of world do we want of if we, we want a world at all but this is more fatalistic they are not really pushing the boundaries of the possible i would say because they adopt this uh, future con uh, model which speculates of many futures from a given present. And within these futures that are possible, they um, organize it in, into the, into certain areas, the implausible futures, the plausible futures, the probable ones, which we are most likely going towards, for example, the end of the world and all kinds of uh, catastrophes that they believe are very much probable to happen. And they draw attention with this model that has preferable possibilities that we should strive and we should um, work towards them. But this is still conservative to think about uh, the future because it seems like we cannot um, do anything that's outside of this cone of anything that there's nothing else for us in the future other than what is being seen through these um, perspectives, these this lenses to the future. So um, speculative design, this in very impactful practice that has been developed in the design field, is expanding the future from the probable. So it's probable that we 
end up destroying our world through an atomic uh, nuclear war. But it's also possible that we don't do that. So they try to expand uh, from the probable to the possible. Whereas, so now I'm going to present a little bit of expansive design, which is the practice that I identified and also developed further in my PhD thesis. Uh, which is a little bit different than speculative design, although I draw from speculative design. Because it's more about the present. It's not so much about the future. It's about what we can do and what we can't do right now. That means it is the difference from the possible and the impossible. And not the possible future, the possible present, but also the impossible present that we can claim. Coming back to the uh, the, the saying of the, the, the motto of the students of 68. Yes, indeed, we can be realistic and demand the impossible. This is one of expansive mottos, uh, one way of understanding what expansive design means. But we go uh, further away from what the situationists did in the 68, and we try to develop these more long-lasting practices that have, uh, um, that have some roots in reality and not just um, do things that create situations that are ephemeral. We try to create situations that are long lasting because we try to push the boundaries of the possible. So, here is one way, another way of understanding uh, the relationship with the possible and uh, the futures and the present. Instead of using time as a way of organizing our ideas, like in the future con, I'm using space. And let's think about the possible as a box of possibilities that, of action that we now consider to be possible. And whereas the impossible are the impossible things that can happen or impossible actions. And for you to um, perhaps connect with a politics and with a general culture or even to internet memes, you might have seen uh, this word, this word in, in uh, somewhere else. It always seems impossible until it's done. It's generally attributed to Nelson Mandela, the former president of uh, South Africa. However, I couldn't find an exact source that would make sure that the, he that said these words in those words. Although I think it's very much attributable because he has done something like that. Ending the apartheid in South Africa seemed impossible uh, while he was in jail, but then he kept going on and he managed to do that after he exited the jail. And, transform the help his own country together with a lot of people. So in, if I put him on an analytical understanding of what he's saying, it means that the possible can get old <laughs> and a new possible can come in. And that's in between the impossible and the possible. And within this um, uh, sweet spot, which is expensive design harbors and develops this practice, well, this sometimes looks like thinking outside the box. Some people understand expensive design as the same as thinking outside the box. Uh, well, that's fine, fine and fair enough, because there's a lot of people telling <laughs> and, and, and raising this discourse uh, here and there. But I would say it's the opposite. Expensive design is really about thinking inside the box, because you want to change that box. You want to remake that box. How can you change the box if you don't think about it? and if you don't understand the limitations. So this kind of, of um, thinking of the outside of the box is more similar to a speculative design. And indeed, a lot of speculative design has been very irrelevant to change our present situation. They warn us about a future that is somehow far detached to our present situation. Or on the other hand, it's too fatalistic for us to do anything. It seems like, all right, we can just wait for the end of the world and do nothing. And that's the kind of um, mindset that we don't want to foster with expansive design. Expansive design do a similar thing. We go through the thinking about the impossible and even reaching up to the unthinkable. But we come back to the old possible. Uh, we come back to the, to the pos old possible and we, we bring out some friction so that a new possible can, can uh, emerge. But while we are coming back to the, the, the box, to change the box, we realize that the box is not empty and remaking the box requires facing contradictions that bind the do's and don'ts that generates the same boundaries that created the box. So the, this box is made out of thought, but also made of, of spaces um, of things that are concretely uh, preventing people from doing things. 
And that's what uh, expensive design really needs to uh, face. So it's not that easy. It's not just about thinking outside of us. We really have to face those contradictions. I try to represent it graphically in this way. So you have contradictions binding, um, uh, gluing together the possible and the impossible, but in a certain way that it doesn't change. But on the other hand, there is some friction, there is some tension, there is some movement there, which is about to explode. And an expensive design is about releasing carefully this tension, which is called contradictions. And we do so by designing something called germ cells that can reproduce those same contradictions into a new configuration. So I'm going to explain what germ cell is in a minute, but let's take a look at this graphic uh, explanation first. So these germ cells, they bring those contradictions that were binding the, new, the possible and the possible uh, back to the new possible so that the same contradiction can be seen in a different way and that perhaps we can change that as a society, not just designers. And technically, a germ cell, this is a, a, an theoretical concept that I made into a practice. I'm going to show some practical examples in a minute, but let's take a look at what theory says about it. It's called germ cell because it's the smallest unit, a cell of social relations that can germinate, in other words, originate new activity from a given set of historically accumulated contradictions. So it's a form that you give to these contradictions that allows for sensing, feeling, touching, grasping them. Instead of having just an intuition, instead of just being afraid of them, you can somehow pinpoint where they are. And, but you cannot definitely pinpoint so clearly because if you do so, contradictions are resolved. If they are really contradictions, they need to be alive and kicking and bothering us. Therefore, the form of germ cells are ambiguous, enigmatic, scary, open-ended, controversial, but also playful. And I, I, I expect that examples here will illustrate this very much. Let me start with the best germ cell I found so far. The Treachery of Images, a painting by René Bagrite, a surrealist painter that in the, in the 20s, he conveyed, he encapsulated the whole history of art, <laughs> but also even the whole history of human language in one single picture. He has this picture of a pipe, and now there is a saying in, just beneath it saying, this is not a pipe. <laughs> so the words uh, deny what the picture shows you, but the picture is also not a pipe. It's an image of a pipe, but that's not enough because it's not an image of a pipe. It should be a pipe. But we, we do so many things in our life where we take the image for the object that it represents. And if we didn't have that, we wouldn't, if we wouldn't rely on that image or on, on representation in general, we wouldn't even have this, having this conversation right now because uh, I am not a, a, an associate professor of <laughs> uh, the University of Florida right now. I'm not even a speaker right now. I'm not even a sound coming to your computer right now. <laughs> Think about it. Uh, we can only do that. We can only have a conversation if we agree upon all, the, all these representations and we accept this contradiction that we cannot not really be truthful all the time to the reality. Reality is deceitful, it's, there's a, it's treacherous, it's treacherous. But the surrealists also develop other ways, other germ cells to grasp contradictions that are much more processual, not just in one single image is statically represented, but in a process. And you could grasp with these processual germ cells more complex, more integrated contradictions, like, for example, the contradictions of dealing with uh, collective creation and uh, the um, uh, unexpected aspect of human behavior, what others are thinking while you are thinking. And in, in this cadaver exquisite or the exquisite uh, corpse in English, you would draw a part of the, your drawing and you would fold it without other uh, um, collect, collaborative uh, um, artist with, uh, with you, would, uh, he, the other person would not see what you have drawn and you would pass over so that person had to speculate what you have been drawing just for uh, a small part of, the, of your drawing and then you would con have to continue that and after all the parts have been drew um, uh, blindly then you reveal to uh, everybody else what we collectively have created with this exquisite corpse. So usually you had this malformed corpse and and, and, and images 
that uh, try to bring something, some contradiction from the unconsciousness to the consciousness of society. And inspired by a surrealism, a theater of the past, and the work of Augusto Ball, the Brazilian dramaturg who um, created it, uh, he devised some dramatic games that similarly could um, somehow bring the contradiction of oppression to our senses and let us use our bodies uh, to remove ourselves from um, postures that uh, allowed only for fixed meanings and enabled our bodies to um, move and to express things that we usually don't do it. And, and in this book, Stop Sense Magic, and many other books where he's drawing from surrealism, he explained his practice. I draw a lot on um, theater of the press. I have been going through a uh, process of training and education in this area, especially in the central, the Chato de Primido in Rio de Janeiro, a place where I've been many times. And in this picture, you see myself uh, uh, playing the role of um, a male abuser, sexual abuser in a, in a party. And in this situation, I feel awkward because I don't identify myself with this kind of role, but I know that people like me, the white male, uh, heterosexual, and also um, alpha male, as they sometimes call it, uh, people like me usually uh, behave like that. And I cannot escape being that, uh, being that role. People, uh, they, they, they socialize myself in that role. So I cannot escape being a character in this role and experiencing and understanding also from the perspective of the press of how and why people treat me the way they do. So the of the press has been very important for me to understand why people f usually in Brazil put myself on the presser side and uh, somehow are afraid of interacting with me, especially women and especially uh, black folks and uh, indigenous even uh, worse. So theater of press was very important for me to understand myself that I could, uh, uh, why well, uh, I, I've been socializing the oppressor side, but also how could I be on the other side as an ally to the oppressed? I'm not doing this in this uh, specific um, play, but I've done it in other situations. And also playing the oppressor in this role and, and, and embodying the contradiction that oppressors have with the oppressed is also a way of playing an ally to the oppressed so they can practice with me. They can exercise attempts to liberate and see if they succeed. And as a good oppressor, I have to stay <laughs> very oppressive and, and, and try to uh, make them give up their attempts to liberate. Well, I don't want to talk too much about the of the oppressed because my point here is to show many different uh, ways of um, doing expensive design. We draw on of the press, but also surrealism, other references, you can check BHD thesis, which is openly available on the internet. But for a summary of it, we try to carefully release the tension accumulated in contradictions and um, with that, create an open new possibilities for acting together. And there are many ways of doing that, theater being just one of them. So we try to generate these germ cells and I'm going to now uh, go through many different kind of germ cells. This is more like to show a rainbow of possibilities. And I'm not going to describe them into, uh, into any detail because I just want you to have a glimpse of these possibilities. Later on, if you have specific questions, I can probably uh, go more into details in one of these cases. Let me start with the most simplest ones that I have found. Handmade germ cells. Just pick up plasticine or clay or any kind of pliable material and try to uh, model these contradictions with your senses in a very intuitive way. You don't. You should avoid using words because words are very difficult to grasp contradictions. It's much easier if you try first to create this handmade model. And in this one example, a student of, of ours in the Federal University of Technology uh, was trying to grasp what, uh, why black people in Brazil would eventually vote for anti-black politicians like our former president uh, Jair Bolsonaro. That's a contradiction that could not get into his head. You can see from his hand, he's white and he's not understanding, but he's trying to make sense of it uh, with this model. And with his, this, that model really helped him, him to understand the role of religion that was tapped by Jair Bolsonaro and his followers, but also media, social media and the kind of uh, fragmented communication that it enables it. And he grasped this in a, in a few minutes 
by reflecting on his um, uh, field data and uh, trying to synthesize all of that into this handmade germ cell model. Next, germ cell image. Those are similar to the surrealist uh, imagery, but also draw on more information design approaches. Uh, first of all, I love this project by uh, Alanis uh, Kosaki and Vitoria Zukowski. Though they were my students in the, uh, gra um, the uh, graphic design program here at the University of Technology Paraná. And they uh, created this crisis deck so that she they could share with other students what was like going through the last years of their studies and facing existential crises, like for example, working for capitalism that is destroying our world and or doing something um, against it and not being able to pay their bills. <laughs> and this was uh, one of the initial uh, uh, crises that they went through, but they discovered other ones by talking and dialoguing with other students. And they created this marvelous card decks that could be used into a, um, a facilitated or complicated dialogue. And they try, try that in a few workshop sessions. And other students, they really loved uh, to use those cards because it helped them to realize that they were not the only ones facing those existential crises. And they could perhaps find that there was a social reason for, feeling those, uh, for facing those crises. And the last example of image jumps and models was created during the pandemic times where we had to do these kind of workshops online. And in this case, we experimented using emojis and trying to convey an idea, a very complex idea, only through emojis. That, that's a very interesting, inspiring example because emojis are very ambiguous and that's the power of them. And expressing contradictions using a combination of emojis enables you to uh, go through the nuances that are can't be completely resolved through reason. You have to rely also on emotions to grasp them. Now, let's jump to metaphorical models, uh, drawing for, uh, mostly on legal serious play methodology, but adapting it to dialectical thinking, which is the basis of expansive design. And in this case, we have done uh, quite a lot of uh, workshops with a company, a utility company here at Paraná State. And this company was facing contradictions like having to expand its uh, um, energy generation uh, sources, but having natural finite resources. So finite resources. So you could not expand over what then uh, what uh, uh, nature could provide. And they tried to convey that through this legal serious play model, this metaphorical model. We use, for example, um, an alligator that you love so much. <laughs> the University of Florida used an alligator to represent, for example, the power and the force and the menace that uh, nature represents to humans. And uh, later on, after compiling this model, they uh, tried to convey and to express these contradictions to a young entrepreneurs that they wanted to draw to the energy sector, especially to uh, help with the the, the transition to smart grids, where you would have many different energy sources, not just the, the water uh, energy uh, uh, source, which is the main one used in Brazil, which is green, but not without uh, environmental impact. Nowadays, there's a lot more solar and also a, um, uh, wind energy and wind turbines. But the problem is that these wind turbines and, and solar energy, they, they are not really good for the poor people uh, currently with the current policies. Uh, it usually is raising the price of the energy generated through, through water because uh, they are somehow have received some subsidies. And in this situation, what could uh, an entrepreneur do to create more social and fair distribution of energy for everyone? This was one of the contradictions that they wanted to pose to uh, the ecosystem, the entrepreneurial ecosystem to solve. Next, uh, we're going to now take some example, the gem cell theater and theater of the press, of course, in this kind of adaptation of between theater of the press and, and design, uh, broad is charming. Our students are trying to uh, embody the contradictions of designing a garment that is to be the equivalent of the female bra. So they, they call it the scrotion in uh, reference to the Brazilian word for bra, which is sution. Uh, and in, in, in French, it's uh, something like that. It's a French uh -huh. word. But it's a garment for the male scrotum, and they are playing out an, an interview where the garment itself is 
He's telling, look, I am the, <laughs> the scrotion and I do this, I do that. My uh, purpose is to keep male uh, scrotum healthy and, and clean and it, it doesn't fall up with, uh, with the, gravi- the, the effects of gravity along the years so that me, man can be in a really good shape. So they are tapping into the discourse that uh, justifies the usage of uh, female bra, or I would say that uh, the bra that uh, so-called women use it in our society, and they devised then uh, a whole range of products for um, and uh, graphic imagery to advertise the, the advantages of using scrotion and its varieties, like the dry fit version for um, doing uh, <laughs> sports. And of course, it, it is laughable and it's a bit uh, humorous, but it's also uh, very uh, irritating to see this imagery and seeing how gender um, inequalities is still uh, very much embedded into the, the fashion design that we now uh, accept as normal. They are really trying to push us the boundary to see that, well, if it's possible for a, a bra being a requested uh, garment for women, expected one for women, why not having the scrotion be an expected garment for men? Well, that's really possible. And, and that's why it's not a speculative design. It's really about the present. And that's why it bothers us so much, especially men like white men like me. We get really uh, <laughs> we get challenged with these kind of projects. And uh, now jumping to more complicated uh, jump cells like games. This takes more time to devise, and it's also more, um, more uh, complex and in that you can represent much more contradictions. You can represent many contradictions into a, uh, a game system. And that's what I have done in my PhD thesis. Uh, next to my PhD thesis books, the book that you have seen before, I delivered a, a, a board game called The Expansive Hospital. And it's a playful game that embodies all the contradictions that I have faced while studying uh, hospital design projects in the Netherlands. Later on, I brought this game to play in Brazil. And it turns out that the same contradictions also appeared here, for example, the stakeholders not agreeing on what is best for the hospital and wanting to uh, put their uh, personal interest or even the company interest over the best interests of the hospital itself. Um, we also devised a lot of other games. I'm not going to jump into most of them because I love redesigning games. I'm just going to give you just one more example. Thinking inside the box, this is a card deck um, device for entrepreneurs to develop their um, new skills but without losing autonomy. Many entrepreneurial programs, they put uh, entrepreneurs into a, a, um, a learning process, uh, a startup acceleration program, for example, where they have to follow very strict steps like uh, Herbert Simon would have done in the past. But while doing so, uh, these entrepreneurs could not design their own path. They could not learn about themselves and de- develop their own design approach. With this game, it's different. You have many different um, cards that each represent a possible action for you to do. Every time you do an action, you accumulate some points, and then you can all the time see where your team fits within the possibilities for developing the skill set of your team. And you can see how specialized you are with some aspects of uh, entrepreneurship activity and despecializing other ones that are not relevant. And there are the main contradiction that this game um, reproduces is this contradiction between guidance and autonomy. You have to guide a new entrepreneur because he doesn't know uh, how to uh, develop a new business. But if you guide the entrepreneur too much, he will be dependent on it and he won't develop the necessary autonomy, which is crucial to be a good entrepreneur. And this has been uh, put and shared into the public. So if you read Portuguese and if you're interested in translating it with, it's a, um, a Creative Commons project you can search on google and you'll find out the website where you can uh, download it and interact with it uh, actually i have to say this is connected it's an also um, a spin-off from the utility company startup acceleration program i showed you before uh, next is germ cell maps and these maps are uh, collaboratively done or made so we invite people who inhabit those that space to uh, bring over in the, the contradictions to the map, and in this case, we uh, in, in the 
in the Change by Design workshop in 2013, the Architecture Sans Frontiers organization, they run um, a, a series of inquiries in the, into our, um, our regional park state, the uh, public housing unit, and uh, it was about to be um, demolished part of it for a new um, major infrastructure project. And the residents wanted to tell what they would lose with this uh, demolish. And they uh, invited or they partnered with Architecture Saint Frontiers uh, to summarize their demands and their needs. And we invited, as it was a part of the team, we invited uh, the passenger buys, the people who live there, to join and have a cup of tea and chat about their experiences and use the game to um, register those experiences. So we showed some some icons and they could choose those icons and play out some stories within the map of the, the state. And later on, this will be compiled to generate uh, overall uh, views of all the main issues that they were facing there and uh, the things that they could trade for the demolishment. So they could demand other improvements in the state in, uh, in, uh, in exchange for accepting or uh, yeah joining the accepting the demolition, demolition and also moving to another place. And the, the, another example, which is more recent, in 2023, no, 2022, last year, we joined uh, Unipedifa Collective into organizing some community action in the outskirts of Curitiba. And uh, the people who live in the outskirts of Curitiba was part of Unipedifa. They came to the university. We played this very nice mapping game where we try to uh, map the most tense or the tensest contradiction in the region in the uh, within the state uh, that where they lived, and in this situation they found out the the community uh, center harbor most of this contradiction because it wasn't being maintained, uh, but a lot of community members in the past they use it so. It's, it was a symbol that community didn't work, doing any community work. So they first decided to renovate the center to start doing uh, other and further community initiatives. If they didn't have done anything with the community center, it, it would be a hard time for the community itself to get engaged with the initiatives. So our students joined and do, did something that graphic designers usually are not trained to do, like painting and, um, and fixing some furniture and and they did this uh together with the community and that opened up the possibility for doing other things that are more related to graphic design later on and the last example is germ cell data visualization that's the most completely requires you to collect data for and usually generating data about contradictions is difficult usually you find contradictions uh, in the interpretation of the data while you devise the the, the graphic generation models, like when you decide what does color means, what does uh, any, any kind of uh, symbol use in the picture means in terms of data, how do you generate these images, in, in other words. And in this picture, you see an, an attempt uh, of our students um, trying to figure out what was a pattern of digital trends evolution. We have been mapping uh, digital trends for almost four years between the 2015 and 2018 and we had more than almost 2,000 digital trends mapped and they only compiled this big visualization and we found out the most stable trends they created these um, loopholes where they would protect themselves from new trends to challenge them and we found out and ultimately digital trends they produce uh, a very conservative pattern of doing the same all over because new trends that would challenge existing trends, they will not be able to connect to the to the old trends. They will be pushed out and they will die soon as a, uh, as the so-called um, uh, the law, the, the, the valley of disillusionment where you see, for example, a new trend um, being, uh, being forgotten. Uh, this is another project where we also mapped a lot of different initiatives during the pandemic times. Um, it's really a huge map of uh, all the initiatives in Brazil that we have gotten to know through the news media. 
and we try to find the contradictions between the problems and solutions that have been posed in the public. And this map has been shared with a city council member of Curitiba, Maria Leticia. She's still a council member nowadays. And she used uh, this huge map to separate a part of it and, se and, and focus on the specific contradictions that matter to uh, the citizens of Curitiba and especially to people who voted on her. So it helped her to understand also the limitations of what she could do as a city council member and what uh, other is public institutions could do. So to summarize uh, my uh, presentation, Changing the possible seems impossible when the possible is reduced to individual preference. Uh, people need to be respected to their preferences. However, changing the possible becomes possible when the possible is expanded to democratic liberation, uh, eventually being using germ cells, as I've been showing here. There may be other ways, even more diverse than what I have been showing here, where the possible can democratically be deliberated. Well, speaking of germ cells, they definitely do not solve or resolve contradictions. They leave them open for people to do something about them, and then therefore they are used in the democratic liberation process. And in, to speak very directly, expensive designers are not problem solvers. They are most likely problem posers. They help to figure out uh, what are the contradictions that are really pressing us and organize our collective consciousness to deal with them. So now about the prospects of doing that in the US. I'm a little bit thrilled and scared of doing that because the US is known, at least in Brazil, as the land of personalization, of individualism, of uh, choosing any kind of uh, product, service, and even politicians that you want. <laughs> but uh, of course not. My answer to that is it's not possible to do expensive design in the US. If it would be possible, it wouldn't be expensive design. Expensive design is really playing at this border, at, at, this, ex, at this land of uh, unknown, at this, this, this situation where the tension is really harboring and concentrating between the possible and the possible. All right, so uh, I really would like to try and I invite anyone that also wants to join with this uh, attempt. Yeah, let's do expensive design together. Let's try and do it. <laughs> So these are the references I'm going to share later on the slides, and you can also find it on my website on fredfenomster.com. And thank you very much. I'm really glad to have you here now and to engage to dialogue. I want to check the, the chat box, but anyone can also open the mic and join, join the discussion. Thanks.